In football, for the ball possession moments, we used to distinguish between two very different styles of play, with one extreme being positional play and the other being vertical play, so one patient type of football and an impatient one, both displaying very specific behaviors. Of course, the majority of teams can be considered hybrids because they adapt certain behaviors emanating from both of these types of football. But what interests us today is that a third style is currently making its mark at the top level and it's radically opposed to both positional play and vertical play because it totally challenges the notion of tactical formations. This type of football is relationism, at least that's how the man who popularized it calls it. I'm referring here to Scottish coach Jamie Hamilton, who you can find on Twitter, where he relays the high-quality football articles he writes on Medium. The links are in the description. So I invite you to follow him, because that's how I discovered this type of football and its main figure, Fernando Dienes, Fluminense's successful coach and recently also Brazil's coach, where he appeared to be the solution to launch a new dynamic in the Seleção, which has been frustrating for several years at the World Cup, despite having one of the best squads in recent editions. But the reason Fernando Dennis is the talk of the town, even though he will only be the coach for one year before Carlo Ancelotti takes over the Auri Verdes reigns, is that the way his Fluminense team play is completely different from the rest of the footballing landscape, and seems to be just what the Brazilians need to reconcile themselves with their national team whose play has repeatedly been regarded as European in the country. European because it used to be based on positional play, which, as I explained in a video dedicated to it a few months ago, advocates a so-called rational occupation of space based on the position assigned by the chosen formation. If you're a right-winger, you stay one and you regain your position if an action has taken you into another zone. And that's precisely what Dennis doesn't like describing his Fluminense as appositional, and rightly so. After they build up from the back, we often see almost all the outfield players move towards one side of the pitch, which might remind us of certain teams that tend towards vertical play if we freeze frame, but the idea behind it is completely different. In one, in vertical play, we are dealing with a well-defined structure so that specific players can counter-press and win second balls when they need to force the play, which they don't hesitate to do because they want to go quickly forward. Whereas in the other, they use this proximity to bring more uncertainty through a barely rigid structure. The central defenders and the striker do tend to hold their position, but the one of the other players is anything but predictable, as they embody the great freedom of movement that Dennis encourages. Hamilton thus contrasts positionism, a paradigm in which players must occupy a certain position with relationism in which the importance is put on the way in which players relate to each other. The terms jogo de mobilidade or mobility play and jogo functional or functional play which are used in Brazil to describe this type of football have made me think a lot about the word relationism since you don't necessarily have to pass the ball to act in a relationship so I find mobile proximity play more appropriate and also more precise than its Portuguese counterparts, even if the key does lie in relationships. As there is less concern about occupying the space allocated and not leaving its position, Dennis players adapt above all according to the ball carrier. As the ladder is often very close, he tends to offer himself directly elsewhere for a 1-2, which would be much more complicated with a greater distance between the players, as passes tend to arrive later giving the opponent more time to react. Proximity indeed allows things that distance doesn't, and I'm going to explain them point by point, but I think it's important that you already have that in mind, because that's how you come to understand that there is more to Dennis than just the idea of generating numerical superiorities behind these tilts on one side of the pitch. So it's not surprising that when the central defenders receive the ball, they don't try to switch play, especially as there are other ways of getting out of the overload. For example, the unlocking often comes from the possibilities offered by an escadigne, a term that refers to the diagonal formed by two players on the same passing lane. Not only does this structure make it possible to take advantage of a third player after 1-2, but it also gives rise to another concept, the corta lures, letting the ball pass to the player at the other end of the diagonal, what is called a dummy in English. 
It's obviously a superb way of progressing, but it's just as useful in cutback crossing situations. And once again, it's quite likely that if you extend the distances, the opposition would have enough time to react in this kind of situation. The fact that Denny's teams overload one side rather than the center of the pitch also favors the emergence of this Cortelus, since the more vertical the diagonal, the less likely it is to work out well as opponents position themselves between the closest player and their own goal, which would be in this case on the passing lane. Note that Denis has invented the concept of the 1-2 or the Cortelus, but he has created the context where these progression patterns can be maximized and it is perhaps precisely this playing context in which the Brazilian player is most comfortable. That's at least what the case of Ganso suggests, who was considered by some to be even more promising and talented than Neymar when they were firing together at Santos, but Ganso never managed to live up to expectations once in Europe, neither at Sevilla nor at Amiens. Transferred then for free to Fluminense, Ganso has been shining since the arrival of Fernando Diniz, even sparking rumors of a possible return to the national team. Capable of playing passes no one expected, Ganso actually suffered from a cruel lack of athleticism in Europe, a huge lack of acceleration between others, but he also suffered from the fact he wasn't familiar with the type of football being played there, as you can see in the coming sequence. Ganso gives and goes, as we say, but Enzonzi is not going to opt for 1-2 with him, and there's good reason for that. If he loses the ball, he wouldn't be able to block the different options the opposition would have to progress because he's all alone in the middle. Keeping his position therefore makes sense, but it also limits the unlocking possibilities, something Fernando Diniz doesn't want. So, to remedy this, players come closer together. This leaves less space for opponents to start a counter in case of a ball loss, while at the same time players dare to offer themselves elsewhere because as several teammates are in proximity, one of them can quickly compensate the movement. But even if this proximity facilitates counter-pressing, there are good reasons to be uncomfortable with it, which may also explain Nzonzi's decision. It's indeed possible that he felt the space in question was not big enough for Ganso to use it, especially since an opponent could have reacted after seeing the Brazilian start his run. So one could think that this mobile proximity play could only work out well with players who used to be familiar with these small spaces during their use, whether by playing futsal and or in the street, hence the perfect match with the Brazilian players. The thing is, surely inspired by Denis Fluminense, Malmö and its coach Henrik Rittström are showing that something similar is possible in Europe, and this with a lot of local players, while Sweden isn't known for having many players of a so-called Brazilian profile. So after reading about this, I started analyzing these two teams to look for other advantages of this mobile proximity than those that Jamie Hamilton has popularized and that I have presented so far, like the Cortelus. Before discussing the other advantages of mobility, let's begin with those of proximity, starting with the attraction of opponents. It's ended very difficult not to be attracted by the ball carrier when you're so close, which is partly why Brighton's very tight and low double pivot has long triggered the pressing of opponents, which often frees another player, which is why many of Malmö's and Fluminense's progressions also stem from this phenomenon. And if opponents are reluctant to pressure the ball carrier, it's often no longer the case when a pass is being played to the player closest to them, because they then start to move and tend to continue the run when the ball is being passed back. In a way, overloading a side can also attract opponents by attracting their glaze, since even though the defensive line, for example, is further away from the ball, it's still quite close, and this may not work in its favor, as shown here with the defender who seems to forget to defend the space. But even without being attracted in any way, Opponents can more often be vulnerable because they are potentially forced to change their body orientation more often as a long pass is no longer needed to go to the other side. The reaction times required to shuffle across make these pivotal moments ideal situations to exploit a gap in the defense, especially by going back in the opposed direction. Going against the opposition's flow will lead to another change of direction and therefore another moment of vulnerability. <laughs> 
And last clear advantage of proximity I found is that it is easier to hide your pass because the distance means you can play an outside foot or lace its pass from a standstill. And that has a surprise effect for the opponent because a classic pass can be anticipated with the leg going back first and the body being already oriented towards the receiver, which isn't the case with an outside foot or laces pass. As for mobility, it first complexifies things for the opponents, who are often defend by sticking to a certain structure, to the point of forgetting the very activity of defending, as we saw in certain Malmö matches, where when the winger went to the other side, the fullback continued to occupy the same space, whereas he would be better off asking for the defensive line to shuffle across so that there is no numerical inequality elsewhere. There is here no longer any threat to prevent where he is, and that's something one can notice several times watching Malmö matches, so maybe it's a sign that by asking his players to adopt a rigid structure no matter what, they will struggle to adapt and tend to stick to these instructions. But maybe these non-adjustments are also due to cognitive fatigue, as playing against Malmö also means experiencing constantly changing situations during the course of a match, whereas other teams play a more predictable game. But this advantage was initially a disadvantage for the Malmö players, as someone who had attended a training session during their preseason last winter testified, where this mobile proximity was something new for them. The fact that they weren't at ease is certainly linked to the cognitive aspect, as they weren't used to having so many players relatively close together, so there was a lot of priority information to consider, as well as decisions that they had perhaps not thought about for a long time, because they went against the idea of maintaining the rigid structure that was until there the chosen means of trying to obtain a good result. And let's not forget that, from a cognitive point of view, this mobile proximity play makes almost as much demands on the players furthest away from the ball, precisely because they are not so far away, so they can very quickly be required to receive the ball or move to free a teammate. But if the Swedish team showed that it was able to adapt fairly quickly to this paradigm shift, there's perhaps also an advantage in the long term with this greater involvement of players further away from the ball, as we know that players often like to feel close to the ball because they like to take an active part in the game. I don't know if this revolution will take place in other big teams, but I think a lot of European coaches would find it hard to bring out this type of football not only because some of them also like to feel as important as possible and take a dim view of anything that leaves a little more room for chaos, but above all because such a radical change for the players requires time and coaches don't have much time to implement such a paradigm shift. And let's not forget that Malmö surely has one of the best squads in the Swedish league, so surely not any team, even at the top level, as players capable of achieving greater success within the maximum expression of this type of football. Perhaps some coaches are also waiting to see whether this success would still be the same against a team with a very good pressing that can be oppositional too. But whatever happens, mobile proximity play will always be able to boast of having highlighted the impact that greater freedom of movement can have and of certainly having opened our eyes to a new conception of space. Although Eric Tenag and Julian Nagelsmann popularized the concept of minimum width, to my knowledge, a team's playing space has never experienced such extremes in modern football, although several teams were not far off the mark by showing they were capable of keeping the ball at 9v9 in a similar space, before switching play to a dribbler who could make the difference in the 1v1 that was isolated. Perhaps these teams would be the most likely to take the step towards a more hybrid style of football by adopting a mobile approach at times, but logic would suggest that it would be the South American teams who would first be inspired by this idea, which seems to fit in well with the culture of different countries on the continent. Argentinian expert Jorge Valdano, for example, said that the last World Cup had reconciled them with their culture, adding that they no longer see Europe as a model now. Valdano was particularly pleased that the Albi Celeste players' ability to improvise was more apparent in this more mobile style of play compared to the one of the previous editions. Greater creativity can notably be the key when facing a low block letting very little space, or rather very little space for an ordinary team, since Fluminense and Malmö are used to playing in the similar number of square meters to what gives a low block. They are also used to going wide when they get close to their opponent's box, and this is perhaps their final advantage, 
since unlike teams that rely on positional play, Malmö and Fluminense sometimes only stretch their opponent's defensive line at the last moment, which poses a real dilemma for the defenders, with questions such as do I also go wide when the other members of the defensive line can't necessarily see me, especially as they are looking at the ball which isn't far in front of them, and if I do shuffle across, how far do I go? And if there's a shuffle, how far do I come towards the player who has gone wide? So each member of the defensive line may have to face these questions in turn, which means other moments of weakness. But it has to be said that this mobile proximity play may also currently benefit from its rarity, as defenses are not used to these scenarios, so perhaps we should ask ourselves some questions before trying to copy Dennis and Ridstrom, because even if players can feel freer with this type of football, I think that some, because of their profile, would compromise the success of such a paradigm. But if it's not ideal for a first team, giving it a place in youth development, however small, could be beneficial in encouraging the development of certain qualities in young players. Time will tell whether this type of football will spread further until it appears in the Premier League or Champions League in its fullest expression, but perhaps it could happen quickly, successfully or otherwise, if Denis succeeds in establishing it at the Selecao and, by sticking to this paradigm, Ancelotti leads Brazil to victory at the next World Cup. People copy easily, for better or for worse.